Welcome to a new lesson of the Haskell course. This is the first lesson of the abstracting pattern sections of the course. In this lesson, we will cover what does it mean to abstract a pattern? Why should we abstract patterns in general? I'm going to present a teaser about why abstracting semigroup and monoid specifically. Then we are going to actually abstract the pattern and create the semigroup type class and the monoid type class. And finally, once we understand how they work, we're going to see what can actually be accomplished with these type classes. So, what does it mean to abstract a pattern? We humans are very good at detecting patterns. For example, in the sixth lesson of this course, we wrote these functions. The function to sum a list of integers, the function to multiply a list of integers, and the function to combine a list of booleans with the AND operator. Once we wrote this, we figured out that there was a repeating pattern in all of those functions. So we created a single one that contains that pattern and takes whatever is different as argument, the fall right function. And then, because we have the function that represents the abstract idea of applying a function to combine the first value of a list and the result of recursively applying the same function to the rest of the list, or more succinctly, reducing a list using a binary operator, we replaced the implementation of the original functions with the abstraction like this. That series of steps, first write some code, then identifying a pattern in that code, then create a structure to contain that pattern if it's useful, and finally use that structure instead of explicitly writing the pattern. In our case, in Haskell, by structure, we mean types, functions, and type classes. Other programming languages may use different ones, like object-oriented classes. So this is what we mean when we talk about abstracting a pattern. As a small caveat, it's important to note that we shouldn't extract all patterns. As I said before, we humans are very good at detecting patterns, but not all of them are worthy of abstraction. But don't worry about that for now. You'll learn to tell the difference with practice. So we know how to abstract patterns, but why should we abstract patterns? That will be a reasonable question to ask. And there are several reasons. The most notable ones will be to easily reuse code. As we saw in the previous folder example, know that you have implemented the recursing pattern once, you can use it anywhere. It's also useful to hide unimportant details. Also in the previous example, we hid the details of exactly how we implement recursion inside fall right. Thanks to that, the code becomes a short one-liner that only shows what we care about, which binary function we apply, and what is the starting value. And a third one, to have a clear and concise code that you and others can quickly understand. By using fall right instead of explicitly writing the pattern, the reader instantly knows what's going on. We are folding a list. One second is enough to know what this line of code does, and we can move on. These reasons apply for every correctly derived abstraction. But what about semigroup and monoid specifically? To make sure that I get your full attention throughout the rest of this lesson, I will share a real-world problem that becomes significantly easier by abstracting semigroup and monoid, and that is scalability. More specifically, scaling computations and scaling the result complexity without increasing the code complexity. If you have worked with any programming language in production, you will likely know this is a tough and complex problem. So we developers need all the help we can get. At the end of the lesson, after learning about semigroup and monoid, we'll see how this abstraction allows us to more easily scale. Let's start with this semigroup type class. In the first example, we abstracted away a pattern into a function, and now we will abstract a pattern into a type class. This is not something new. If you think about it, the num type class is an abstraction of the properties and behaviors a number should have. All numbers should be able to be added, subtracted, multiplied, and so on. 
Some types we think as numbers behave fundamentally different in some ways. For example, we can get fractional numbers with float, but we cannot with integer. So the num type class abstracts away only the behaviors every number-like type should have. Now we're going to do the same someone else did for numbers, but for a different concept. Take a look at this code. What do we have in common in all three cases? You can pause the video if you want to. Well, in all three cases, there's a binary function that somehow combines two values of one type to produce a new value of the same type. And on top of that, the binary operation is associative, meaning the order in which we apply the binary function doesn't matter. As you can see, we can apply the binary function to first abstract me and then apply the binary function to the result of that to a new value. And we will get the same if we first apply the function to me and the exclamation mark, and then apply the binary function to the result of that to the abstract string. So it's associative. And that's the whole concept. A semigroup is a type that has an associative binary operation. That's it. It seems like an arbitrary choice. Like why this abstraction instead of another? Well, it will be clear why at the end of the lesson. However, same as all the abstractions we will cover in this course, it boils down to this. We realize that they are more useful than others. Okay, so now that we have a concept that we want to represent, and we know that we need it to be available for multiple types, we will create a type class that represents it. And this is it. I know, I know, it's a bit anticlimactic. All that hype for a two-line type class. We chose to use an operator that looks like a diamond instead of a regular prefix function because the most common use case, as we saw in the examples we used to extract the pattern, is to apply the binary function as an infix function. Now, wait a minute. What about the associativity? Where does that appear in the code? Well, the sad truth is that not even Haskell's type system, the most powerful of all general purpose mainstream languages, can restrict this property. And because we cannot use code to transmit those requirements, we use loss written in plain text, and we kindly ask developers to follow them. Of course, developers follow them because these laws bring a lot of value. In this case, every time you create an instance of semigroup, you have to make sure to satisfy the associativity law, which as you can see, just plainly represents associativity. If we are combining three values and we combine first the second and third and then the first, we should get the same results as if we combine first the first two and then third. That's it. Okay, we have our abstraction ready. Let's implement an instance to see how that will work, starting with the list instance. We have to choose a binary operation. This is really easy for lists. If you explore the preludes and the data.list modules, or even easier, if you look up the type using Hugo, for example, like this, and we filter, we only want things that come with the base library. We found that there's only one operator that takes two lists to generate another list. And on top of that, it's associative. So we choose the plus plus operator, which we already know that that was the answer, but it's good to go over the process. So now we can implement our instance. Just this time, I will show you all possible ways to do it. But I trust that by now you could figure this out by yourself. So the instance of semigroup for a list of A's defines this diamond operator as the same as the concatenate operator. This will be the same as defining the concatenator operator again using the diamond as a prefix function, or 
define it using the daemon as an infix function. All three implementations are the same thing written differently, so you can choose whichever you want. In this case, because the operator is already defined, the best will be to just use it, as shown in the first implementation. And if you're curious, this is how it's actually defined in the base library. Now that we have our implementation, let's do a rough check that the associativity law holds by doing a few tests by hand. So first we're going to check combining is and this and then true is equal to this true and then combining to is. And we are going to do the same for list of booleans. And if we run this, it will give us truth for everything because the instance is correctly implemented. Of course, this is not proof that the law holds. It's just a suggestion that it seems to work, which is more than enough for us. However, thanks to Haskell's purity, we could prove this law by induction or property testing. That's out of the scope of this course, but I will link an explanation in the video description, just in case you're curious. And that's it. We have our first instance of the semigroup. It seems that all other instances of semigroup will be something like that. So are we done with it? Well, there's one more thing we have to take into account. What if there's no clear answer as to which operator we should use? For example, if we're using numbers, a quick search will give us four binary operators. But wait, if we quickly check for associativity, as I just did, we see that the minus and subtract functions aren't associative. This makes sense because subtraction isn't associative in maths either. So we are left with just two functions. Which one should we use? Both functions satisfy the semigroup requirements of being an associative binary operation. But we can only implement one semigroup instance, or can we? It turns out that some types, in this case all numeric types, have more than one valid semigroup instance. To resolve this, we create one new type per valid and useful operation that wraps the original type. That way, we can implement as many instances as we need because they are different types. In the current case, because both the sum and product operations are valuable, we will wrap the numeric type in the sum and product new types. As you can see, these new types take the type A as constructor and they hold it inside. That's it, they don't do much else. We use record syntax to have an easy to use way to extract the value from inside without the need for pattern matching. So let's run this. So we have the new types. And now comes the magic. We will implement the semigroup instances using their corresponding binary operations, like this. We implement the instance of semigroup for the type sum A in the case that A has to be an instance of the num type class, and we pattern match to extract the inner values, apply the binary operation that we wanted to apply from the get-go, and then wrap again to get the correct type. For the product, we create an instance of semigroup of product, we pattern match the constructors to extract the actual numeric values, apply the manual operation, and wrap again. As you can see, the only thing that changes is that we have to make sure the type inside sum and product are also instances of num in order to have the plus and product operators. Other than that, it's just pattern matching to wrap the numbers, applying the binary operation, and wrapping the results. So, now that we have our instances, let's try them. Let's run this. If we combine sum3 with sum2, we get sum5. So it's 3 plus 2, 5. Perfect. Product5 combined with product9, we get product45. Perfect. And if we check for associativity, if we combine first sum 4 and 5 and then sum 1, has to be equal to combine 5 and 1 and then 4. And we get that this is true as well. And finally, we can combine as many values as we want and then apply the function to extract them to the result. And we get the actual numeric value. 
And this is how we resolve the issue. And it's not the only case. We also have two options between all the orderable types. Both max and min function are associative binary operations, and both make sense to use. So we do the same. We create new type wrappers. I'm going to run this. And we create semi-group instances with the corresponding associative binary operations. Finally, we test it. If we combine the minimum of three and minimum of six, we get minimum three. The maximum of nine and zero, we get nine. The associativity is respected as well. And an example of how we can extract the value after combining max three, max five, max two, which is five. The case for Booleans is very similar. So similar, in fact, that you have to implement it as part of this lesson's homework. But before we move on to monoids, let's implement a semigroup for a type we came up with ourselves. For example, the severity type, a type that represents the severity of an emergency. Let's run this. So the severity can be either low, medium, high, or critical. We don't have any pre-existent associative binary operations. So we have to come up with one. What do you think it will be a good binary associative operation for severity? Pause the video if you want to think about it for a bit. Or better yet, try to implement it yourself. Okay, so here's my answer. We want to combine severity levels. It makes sense that if we have two emergencies of the same severity, we should return one with the same severity. And if they are of different severities, we should return the highest one. So we could define the severity semigroup instance like this. Instance of semigroup for severity where if the first value is critical, I don't care about the other, is going to be critical. Same from the second value and same for the high, the medium. And if the value didn't match with any of these combinations, the only possible combination left is that both are low. So we return low. I think this makes quite a lot of sense. Let's check if the binary operation is actually associative. So if we combine high with medium, we get high. If we combine medium and low, we get medium. And if we first combine high and low, we will get medium. And then we combine with critical, we will get critical. And this should be the same as if we combine first low and critical, we will get critical. And then if we combine high with critical, we get critical. So it's the same result either way. And that's it. We created our fifth semigroup instance. If you understand everything up until now, the next abstraction will be a piece of cake. So let's talk about the monoid type class. The monoid type class builds on top of the semigroup type class to add a small but significant extra behavior. Let's take a look at the same example we saw at the beginning, but with a slight tweak. Did you notice any changes I made in the code? I added one more operation in the second line of each example, but it doesn't affect the end result because one of the values doesn't do anything. We call a value that doesn't modify the result when a binary operation is applied to it, the identity value of the operation. It's not the first time we encounter this concept. We first learn about identities when we learn about recursion and how vital identity values are in defining base cases. And as you can see, one is the identity of multiplication, true is the identity of the AND operator, and the empty string is the identity for concatenating strings, which more generally speaking, means that the empty list is the identity for concatenating list. So if we spell it out, the pattern we are seeing right here is a monoid is a type that has an associative binary operation with an identity, but we already have a type class represented an associative binary operation. So instead of repeating ourselves, we can make monoid a subclass of semigroup and add only the identity element, like this. In this case, here we create the type class monoid 
that adds the MEMTI operation of type A with the restriction that this A type has to also be an instance of semigroup. Here, the MEMTI value represents the identity. It's called like that due to convention. You can read it as M for monoid empty because it doesn't do anything. So MEMTI is monoid empty. And this will be conceptually it. But if we take a look at the actual monoid type class, it might look like this. And why is that? In this case, we have the same empty operator, which is the identity element, but we also have the monoid append operator that is the same as the semigroup operator. And we also have the monoid concat operator that takes a list of monoids and returns a monoid, which is defined as fold right applied to the semigroup operator and MEMTI operator, which is defined here. So as you can see here, the minimal definition is just to define either MEMTI or CONCAT, which makes sense because MAPEN just comes with semigroup and MCONCAT just applies fold right to operations we already have. So the only thing we have to worry about really is the identity element. So those are the extra behaviors they are actually in the monoid type class. But why? Why do we have extra functions? Well, because in previous versions of Haskell, we didn't have the semigroup type class. The monoid type class was self-contained and needed to define its own associative binary operator. The monoid append or mapend function was the associative binary operation we defined in semigroup. And the monoid concat or mconcat function is a behavior that we get for free thanks to having the memt and mapend functions. I say that it might look like this because by the time you're watching this video, we might not have mapend in monoid anymore. Since we now have semigroup, mapend inside monoid is redundant and is scheduled to be removed in future versions of GLC. We didn't remove mapend from monoid when semigroup was introduced because that will have broken virtually every program written in Haskell. So to avoid receiving angry emails from every Haskell developer, the maintainers phase out the changes to give everyone time to catch up before removing it. Notice, however, that here it's happening the same thing that did for associativity in semigroup. The restriction that the MEMT element has to be the identity of the operation is nowhere to be seen. We cannot enforce it with code. So we create laws that indicate to the developer that they have to adhere to some extra rules when implementing monoid instances. These are the monoidal laws. When creating an instance of monoid, you have to make sure that it follows these laws. The right identity law is pretty simple. If we apply the binary operation to any value and empty, we should get the same initial value. For example, if we apply the binary operation to sum4 and sum0, should be the same as just having sum4. As you can see, this is a spoiler that sum0 is the empty element for the sum monoid. And of course, we have to respect the left identity law, which is the same as right identity, but combining from the other side. So we are combining empty with a value and we should get the value. As you can see, sum zero combined with sum four should be the same as sum four. Those are the two identities that you should really worry about. Since the third one, the associativity law, should already be respected because you are using the same operator you use for the semigroup. And finally, the fourth will always be respected as long as you don't define mconcat by yourself, which is not necessary because mconcat is already defined as fall right of the binary operation and empty. And because we already have the binary operation, because we already have semigroup if we are defining monoid, and we already define empty, we already have mconcat. So assuming you don't define mconcat and the semigroup instance is correctly defined, you only need to worry about the right and left identities, which are pretty easy to test. Okay. Let's implement a few monoid instances. This is actually pretty easy because we did the hard part when implementing the semigroup type class. 
Here are the monoid instances for all the types we worked today. The first one is commented because it's already provided by Prelude. So as you can see, the monoid instance for lists is the empty list, as we discussed previously. And all the other instances are pretty straightforward as well. You have to think of a value that doesn't change the result when applied to the semigroup associative binary operator. So if you sum zero to a value, you get the initial value. If you multiply a value by one, you get the same initial value. If you compare if a value is greater than the smallest possible value the type can have, you get the same initial value. And if you compare if a value is smaller than the largest possible value the type can have, you get the same initial value. And finally, if you combine any severity with the lowest one, you get the same initial severity. All pretty easy to do, except maybe for the max and min that you have to figure out that you have to add a bounded restriction to both to make sure that you actually have a maximum and minimum value and to actually provide it as the empty value. So we have our instances and here are a few examples. It's a bit crowdy, I know, but let's go one by one. So summing sum2 combined with memt combined with sum3 should be the same as sum2 combined with sum3. And we see that it is. mconcat, which is for the right applied to the binary operator and memt of a list of values should be this equal to concatenated the values by themselves. And you can see here that having memt or not having it is irrelevant. So we just combine product two and three. Then we ask for the memty value of the max integer. And as you can see, you get minus 92, blah, 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 which is the minimum possible integer. Remember that int is a bounded value. So you cannot have infinitely large and infinitely small integers. And if we combine max2 with memty, which is this super small value, and max3, we get as a result max3 because it's the biggest of all three. We check the same for the minimum int and we get the largest possible int. We do the same, memty combined with this 92 blah, 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 combined with min2 combined with memty, we'll get min2 because it's the smallest of all three values. We can also mconcat, in this case, severity values. So we have memty, medium, memty, memty, and we get medium. So memty just doesn't do anything. And finally, we have that the semigroup operator applied to sum 9 and sum 11 should be equal to the mapend monoid operator applied to sum 9 and sum 11 because they are just the same thing. And this, of course, gives us true. And that's it again. We created our first five instances of monoid. Now that we know about semigroup and monoid, let's answer the big question. What can I do with semigroup and monoid? We already established that by abstracting patterns, you can more easily reduce code, hide implementation details that aren't part of the core logic, and have a clear, concise code that you and others can quickly understand. But that's for all abstractions in general. What do I gain for semigroup and monoid specifically? Let's talk about distributed computation. Imagine you have a data set of stars with various data points, their size, mass, brightness, etc. And we want to know which one is the oldest. We cannot measure the age of a star, so we have to calculate it with a formula that takes all the data of a star and returns its approximate age. If that computation takes one second and we have a data set of a thousand stars, it will take around 17 minutes to complete. Not a big deal. But that's not a realistic number of stars. Gaia, one of the European Space Agency's telescopes, is currently taking precise measurements of close to 1 billion with a B 
of the brightest stars in the sky. That's too big of a number to wrap our heads around. So let's say we get our hands on a data set of 1 million with M, 1 million stars. If you want to run your function on that data set, it will take 114 years to complete. You will likely be dead before that finishes. If only there was a way to reduce the wait time. Well, if the result of an I.O. computation is a monoid, the I.O. computation itself is a monoid too. This means that you could wrap the computation's result with the max monoid, split the work into, let's say, 200 servers that run in parallel, and merge the results as soon as two consecutive servers finish their computation. The end result? Instead of waiting 114 years, you have to wait only six months. 0.5% of the time it will take using a single server. And of course, you could keep reducing the wait by spinning more and more servers. Now, this field could be accomplished and has been accomplished without a semigroup or monoid instances. But having them made it way easier. So much easier, in fact, that we didn't have to change the computation. We just wrap the result with the max constructor and call it a day. We changed one line of code to make our computation parallelizable. Now let's do a more visual example. Let's see how we can scale the result complexity without increasing the code complexity. Let's say we have a social media with a form that a user has to complete with the personal information to create their account. The users then ask to be able to configure their experiences, so we add a settings page that is just another form. After some time, we add a form to change their profile image. We need to add this to the settings form, but also inside the one to create the account, so they can do it right away. So we create a reusable component and put it inside both. Companies also want to use our app, so we add a form for a company settings that also has to be inside the one to open the account. And of course, people lose their passwords, so we create a reusable form to change our password and we'll put it inside the regular user settings and the company settings. This is not only about forms. It's the conventional architecture most programs follow. Combine several components of type A, each individual form, to generate a network or structure of a different type B. That means that every time we add something that generates a more complex end user experience, the complexity of our code increases exponentially because we have to not only create the new component, but also integrate it into the whole system. And with each addition, it gets harder and harder. Now, what if the forms themselves were semigroups? In that case, we don't need to worry about integrating them, since that is done by our associative binary operator. So, as you can see in the image, this complex structure is just the three separate structures combined using the binary operator. And we get an equally simple structure that we could, if we want to, combine with other and other and other and other and the complexity stays the same because the logic to integrate those forms is made once when we create the semigroup instance and is contained in this operator. So in this type of architecture, we combine several components of type A to generate a new one of the same type A. So if we want to add a new form now, it doesn't matter if we already have one, 10 or 100 forms. The complexity is always the same. You still have to build a new form, but you get the integration for free. Those are two fairly obvious ways that semigroup and mono instances help. If you want more examples, you have to do the homework. And if you are thinking, why do we need to separate semigroup and monoid again? Can we just have monoid and that's it? Well, monoid is more powerful than semigroup. 
So based on what we know now, it will make more sense to only have the monoid type class. But here's the thing. Some types can be instances of semigroup, but not of monoid. And it doesn't make sense we have to lose most of the power just because we don't have an identity element. For example, there's a type in Haskell that represents a list that can never be empty. And because of that, it doesn't have an identity element and can never be a monoid. Curious about how that works? Well, do your homework to find out, and I will see you in the next one.